G'day and welcome to Wellywood Wargaming. My name is Damon and in this video I'll be doing a mini Aeronautica Imperialis campaign with my nine-year-old son. Before I get into it though, please do like, share, subscribe and check out the Patreon as well to support me doing more of this type of content. So, Legions Imperialis, I've done another video on that, has kind of replaced Aeronautica Imperialis, I suppose. Long words to say those ones, but Aeronautica Imperialis is, if you don't know already, um, effectively Top Gun in the 40k universe. It is dogfighting with planes. We've got Xenos, we've got Imperials. You can still buy all of the Imperial planes for Legions Imperialis and use them in this game, but sadly you can no longer buy any of the uh, Xenos factions for this game, unfortunately, as Games Workshop no longer support it. I'm pretty gutted about that. However, I am lucky enough to have been in a position to be able to just buy up everything I probably could for Legions Imperialis. There's only a couple of planes that I don't have. Sorry, Aaron Nautica Imperialis. There are only a couple of planes that I don't have, um, and those ones were really just Forge World ones. I've got pretty much every faction all painted up and ready to go. My nine-year-old son, who's much smarter than I am, certainly at that age anyway, um, has really enjoyed playing Aeronautica Imperialis. It's a super fun game. It's pretty accessible. It's easy to get into, but there's also a lot of tactical depth to it as well. Um, so we decided that we'd have a campaign. He absolutely loves playing Necrons, and uh, if you've played Aeronautica Imperialis, you'll know that Necrons are the OP faction of Aeronautica Imperialis. Um, so he's gone with an unlikely Xenos alliance of Tau and Necrons. We are playing four games in this campaign, and he is allowed to take any Necrons and any Tau in this campaign, in each of the scenarios, he can draw from Tau lists or Necron lists. Me, on the other hand, I'm playing the Imperials, so I can draw from any Imperial faction up to the points value of each of these scenarios that we're playing. So I'm going for Custodes, Astartes, Imperial Navy, and of course, um, Astra Militarum as well. Playing four games here. We'll see who uh, comes out of Victorious at the end. I'm not going to go too easy on my son here, but I have made some allowances in these scenarios to make them a little bit easier to play or sometimes just make them shorter because these games can get really drawn out and take multiple hours if you're not careful. Anyway... Uh, we're going to get into the actual campaigns here and I'm going to give you a little bit of a sort of lowdown afterwards to see how it went. A sort of report, I suppose, post-campaign support on the entire thing, but I hope you enjoy it anyway. So here we go. Okay, so first of the four um, scenarios we've got here, we have Strategic Target. I've handpicked all of these because I just think they're all quite different and quite fun. This one's a good way to start the campaign, I think. My son is attacking here with Necrons. We have uh, six Night Shrouds, well, kind of one Night Shroud, but I'll get into the rules in a second. Uh, and I am defending with my Imperials here as well. Now, we have changed and adapted the scenario a little bit just to sort of suit fluffy reasons. Now, um, the players here should have um, it's the attacker has six bombers of his choice so we're using night shrouds here very scary indeed um, and the defender has two fighters with whatever whatever upgrades are available and six ground assets so i've made a few changes here instead of the six ground assets i've gone with two ground assets only two fighters um, as uh, Adeptus Astartes fighters here and of course the Ares gunship there as well to make up for the fact that I don't have the ground assets. Hopefully this pays off. I'm not really sure because I haven't actually used the Ares gunship but on paper it looks very very scary indeed and probably the only thing that I can think of that actually has a chance of denting these night shrouds. Anyway the setup we rolled off to decide uh, which side we're going to go on etc and the next thing I need to talk about quickly is the bombing run. So effectively the Necrons or my son's uh, Night Shroud here um, get six attempts to bomb this central um, ground asset which has 12 structure points. Now they've got six attempts and they have four turns each so a Night Shroud will start on the edge of the table and it has four turns to make its bombing run. Once it's let go of its payload it's taken off the table and the next Night Shroud gets an attempt so almost like six lives I suppose with four turns to be able to actually unleash their payload. Of course the payload for the Necron Bomber is very scary indeed. We'll take a look at that shortly but the victory conditions here, the game ends when the last bomber has completed its bombing run or is destroyed or the target is destroyed there as well. So pretty simple this one. Uh, I have got the two Astartes um, fighters here with uh, my Ares gunship defending here and we'll see what happens as this terrifying bombing run comes in from the Night Shroud here. 
All right, then, as we can see, we have the two Xiphon Interceptors, both of which are Badab War chapters, by the way. See if you can guess which two these are. I do have another one as well, which I'll bring into the campaign later, and you can guess that one too. And we have the Ares gunship in the center there, protected by the two Astra Militarum ground assets with its target in the middle. Of course, the Necrons, my son, does get priority in the first turn of the first game of this campaign. Straight up the guts uh, with a view to making the bombing run in the second turn here. Both of the Xiphon interceptors then went out left and right to try and flank this uh, Necron ship but of course what I always forget about with Necrons is not only how broken and awesome they are is that they all have the Jinx special rule meaning that they can move a square adjacent before they fire um, and when you've got priority there um, after moving into position with all my Imperial forces for the Necrons to then jink just out of your field of vision is pretty annoying. Uh, so the Ares gunship here doesn't get to uh, shoot at all in the first turn as the Necron bomber just jinks out of the way of two of its... Um, you know, attackers here. Uh, the first Siphon Interceptor on the right there, have you guessed which one it is? It is the Marines Errant. Correct, if you got that one. Um, does some shots off here uh, at mid-range, um, but nothing goes through with that one at all. Then uh, one of the ground assets pops off and does two damage, actually, on this uh, five structure point Necron. So in the second turn, we roll for priority again. Of course, the Necrons get it again, meaning that we do a five, uh, I believe, a um, stall turn on the Necron bomber there to be able to get into a position to actually show its rear end at the target and hopefully get some bombs off in the first turn here, or the second turn, should I say. So with priority being rolled here, the Necrons, of course, get it again with a five, a stall turn used here to be able to show the rear end of the plane at the target and try and get some bombs off straight away. Um, and let's see what happens with these first bombs. So five structure points taken off the target already, and that's just in turn two with very little damage taken by the Necrons so far, and that is only their first bombing run. So the second bombing run here comes in, and we are completely out of shape. The Imperials caught off guard entirely. Uh, and what happens here is my son has figured out a way to pretty much break this scenario by coming in and doing the um, number five maneuver, which is the... Um, what's it called, the stall turn, I believe, um, where you can pretty much just show your arse or the arse end of the plane to the target behind you because the bombs are coming out of the rear here and pretty much bomb on the first turn of every bombing run here, which he does every single turn uh, and I fail to get any sort of purchase on these Necrons. I mean, there's five structure points on the Night Shrouds here as well, so unless I get very lucky, it's pretty hard to take these guys out. So I think this scenario is already pretty much sewn up by this point. My nine-year-old son completely outsmarting me and being a little bit of a genius, working out that he can pretty much do the bombing run on turn one. Sure, I could, probably could have played this slightly differently, and I think with more ground assets, as was mentioned in the actual, um, you know, in the actual scenario description there would have been quite different but an absolutely resounding win here for the xenos alliance winning in three turns with only three of the six night shroud bombers um, doing their thing making very very easy work of the target here and the imperial fighters doing absolutely nothing and what i mean these custodies must be very very embarrassed at this outcome, not to mention the Astartes that we've got here as well. So that is 1-0 to the filthy Xenos scum in this four-game campaign. All right then, into the second scenario in this four-game campaign, my son with his Necrons taking the place of Azuyani in this scenario uh, called Through the Webway. Now, I have made some adjustments and allowances in this campaign. Of course, I'm playing with a nine-year-old, so I have to, you know, for one, obviously I'm letting him play Necrons, which I wouldn't do normally, but Through the Webway, we're using this scenario here. I think this was published in one of the White Dwarf magazines a while ago. Pretty fun looking. I haven't played it yet, but it does look really fun. Uh, we have five sort of uh, Webway portals in this game. Now the Defender, my son in this instance, Necrons, is going to be using these Webway portals as sort of Necron portals, so to speak. So 
In the uh, Defender's uh, thing, they get to use five markers that represent these portals and they get to place them anywhere they like on the area of engagement. What happens as well is the Defender sets up off the board. They can decide their manoeuvres uh, in the first turn and they can come on in or out of every single or each of any portal they want to. Um, so they start in a portal pretty much if that makes sense pretty cool and they can use those portals to sort of um, teleport around the board a little bit and do really yankee sort of cool stuff so i think this will be a really fun one my son's slightly handicapped in this in that i get 30 points more than him in my starting allowance so i get one extra plane over him and i've got to destroy the portals pretty much so with this one the way that i win is each of the webway portal markers are ground targets that can be fired upon by the attacker's aircraft. Each marker has a structure of three as well. So when a marker is destroyed, remove it from the area of engagement. The victory conditions are as follows. The attacker is attempting to destroy the webway portals to prevent their foes from contesting the invasion of something or other. Uh, if the attacker destroys three webway portal markers, the game is a draw. But if the attacker destroys four or more webway portal markers, they are the winner. Otherwise, the defender is the winner. Just looking across the board here, we have two Marauders, um, one Thunderbolt Regular, one Thunderbolt Fury, and two Lightning Strikes in this one. So six planes for the Imperial Alliance here, all of which are Navy. You'll notice I used Astartes in my first game and Navy in this one. Uh, I'm pretty much drawing my forces from all of the Imperial forces in the game, whether it's Astra Militarum, Custodes, Astartes, or indeed Imperial Navy. Um, and that's just how it's going down. My son, on the other hand, is going to be using his um, Doom Scythes, I believe, which are, I think, probably the best plane in the entire game of um, Aeronautica Imperialis. They are just absolutely devastating as they have. They, they get rid of their transport capacity for an extra weapon. Both of the weapons are disgustingly good. Okay, so turn one, as I have absolutely no idea where these Necrons are actually going to be coming out of, they could be coming out of any of these portals. My Marauders are here literally just to try and bomb the portals as early as possible to try and get some points on the board. Of course, my son does get the initiative in turn one, though, and ends up getting into very Yankee positions behind both of my Marauders in a position to get tailing fire turn one, which is just disgusting, and I'm very upset about this, of course. But, you know, he's nine, so let's let's just let him have this one. Two structure points delivered onto the first Marauder bomber, while the second tailing fire happens from the other doom scythe over on the right one structure point delivered to the second marauder bomber however now is the necron's turn again and of course the necron is going to shoot first and that was just tailing fire by the way in that first part so the necron's going to shoot first on the right hand bomber and see if he can finish him off only one structure point so far but these are these guys have only got five so all he needs is four more here so over on the right here, we have the Necron going first and shooting to kill on this Marauder who's already suffered one structure point. We're looking to finish him off here with both weapons. We get a few hits here, though, uh, with taking off two more structure points as the um, Marauder shoots backwards with its rear-mounted turret here. Three sixes are rolled to hit with the rear-mounted turret, only one of them doing a, a bit of damage on this guy here as well, so... Over to the left now, the second Necron Doom Scythe, trying to finish off this Marauder Bomber over on the left. And the Marauder on the left. In turn one is the first casualty of the game as it is taken off the board with an absolute hail of fire from the leftmost Night Shroud, or should I say Doom Scythe, sorry. So in turn one, all that happened is one of the Marauders got taken out by a Doom Scythe and we got two structure points taken off one of the gates with the rightmost Marauder dropping some bombs on that one. Unable to take out all three structure points, unfortunately, but there is always next turn. We roll for priority now, initiative, should I say, and of course I get this one. So the Imperials are getting to go this turn to try and recoup some losses on these horrific little um, doom scythes that are just flying around everywhere. Of course, that jink really, really being very annoying before the doom scythes get to shoot as well. Always worth thinking about because as soon as you get into a good position or you get right behind them, they then jink out of the way and you're in trouble.
more tailing fire over here as the rightmost marauder is taken off the table by an absolute barrage of hits from the second doom scythe here absolutely disgusting the necrons should be ashamed of themselves Into turn three now, and my son is using his Night Shroud Bomber to actually access one of the portals, uh, which is pretty cool here. This is the first time he's done it so far in the game, bouncing from one portal to another and getting right in my face over down here on the left. With no Marauder Bombers left, the remaining Imperial Fighters have to go about the game by doing some strafing runs on these ground targets. Now, of course, all that means is I have to sacrifice my altitude here a little bit, which means I'm much more likely to get taken out um, as my altitude is kind of more publicly known, I suppose, by the Necrons. And really here, we just have a dogfight for the rest of the game as the Imperials try to recoup some of those early losses in the game by taking out some of the strategic targets or warp gates. The Necrons proving absolutely terrifying and, of course, very, very destructive with all that firepower, removing both lightnings this turn from the game just after a little bit of a firefight. The rightmost Thunderbolt taking out another one of those portals here with some good shooting from distance just before he gets taken down by a jinky, skanky little Doom Scythe getting into that disgusting tailing position there. So much destructive firepower from these Doom Scythes. One of the weapons giving eight dice at short range with high damage there as well and extra damage too. Just proves too much for the Imperial thunderbolts here with well, the last thunderbolt fury remaining here has to do the right thing as we roll for priority in what is probably going to be the last turn of the game this is an actual absolute clinch here and the imperials do get it pretty happy about this however i made a fatal error here by being too kind to my nine-year-old and letting him go first meaning that he gets to shoot first too if i went first here though i probably would have won this game uh, or made a draw at least by taking three of these portals out however i did let him go first so um, that's what you get for being a soft dad i suppose and he of course moves into position to get tailing fire on me if i'm not too careful I then reveal my five, which again is a stall turn. Seems to be the most popular of all of the ace maneuvers here for both me and my son. We just love doing stall, stall turns pretty much. Um, it's just a fun one to do. So, of course, giving a strategic priority to my nine-year-old son here, he gets into firing position and is able to take out my Thunderbolt Fury in the last turn of the game. I'm trying not to get too salty here as I hurry the game along too much, but yeah, I mean, if I didn't give him the first turn here, then uh, that would have been a very different story, but a really fun one anyway. And again, food for thought in terms of how you might play this next time we actually come to doing this scenario again. All right then, so two out of four for the scummy Xenos here. Um, my son absolutely smashing me in both of the first two games. What can I do in game three though as we look at the scenario that is troop insertion? This one is a pretty cool one. It's a match play one, I believe, and we are going for equal forces in this one. Uh, now what we've got to do is actually land some troops. Now the Necrons don't have as much troop capacity in this one, and my son, being nice, um, decided to give me the edge in this this one as well as I started with the Thunderhawk gunship. Now I do feel like the Necrons so far at least have been far too good for anything that I've thrown at them so far. So let's see how this Thunderhawk gunship goes, painted in the colours of the Sons of Medusa, backed up by its Astartes buddies in those Xiphon interceptors here. This one, troop insertion though, the special rules for this one, pretty cool. The victory conditions, you've got to, it lasts 12 turns until one side is forced to disengage or until only one player has aircraft left operating in the area of engagement. Each point of transport capacity landed within a landing zone zone is worth five victory points so each of those landing zones we're using the um, Astra Militarum ground assets just as proxy tokens for these landing zones the landing zones themselves are every hex uh, adjacent to that asset or that token should I say um, and each of the transport landed gives you points basically so one uh, transport landed is five victory points and that is how the game goes it's actually quite hard to uh, land troops normally uh, you've got to slow down to a very slow speed and altitude to be able to do it however the necrons do have a slightly larger advantage here in that they have the special rule of jump troops so even though they don't have quite as much troop troop capacity um in the uh night shrouds uh, not, not night shrouds sorry um 
Knight Scythes. They have only two troop capacity on those guys. So four in total. Um, they do have jump troops, which means that they can effectively... Um, jump their troops onto those areas if they roll higher than their speed and altitude combined on a d6. If they do not, though, and if they fail that roll, they lose those troops permanently, and that is their only attempt to be able to win this. So really, from an Ekron perspective, they need to land all four of their transport and also take out my Thunderhawk gunship. That is pretty much the goal here. If I land my Thunderhawk gunship's troops at any point in this game, it is mine. So this could be an interesting one to see where we go with this one diagonal setup here as we can see we have the uh, massive Thunderhawk gunship supported by two Xiphon interceptors the Karkaradon Xiphon interceptor and the Marines errant Xiphon interceptor all of these are Badab chapters if you're hard for Badab like I am we've also got the Howling Griffins and the Minotaurs chapter represented here on these um, Storm Eagles or whatever they're called the uh, other troop landing Astartes planes that we've got here. Pretty cool looking guys. I'm really happy with how these turned out. And that's pretty much that for the Astartes group. Over on the other side for the Necrons though, we have two Night Shrouds and two uh, Night Scythes here as well. So not like the Doom Scythes, these ones have actually sacrificed their secondary weapon for the troop capacity of two each. The Night Shroud Bombers don't actually get anything in terms of troops. Um, but yeah, we'll see how this one goes as we roll priority with the Necrons, of course, getting turn one. Into the next turn here, we have the Imperials just going straight up the right-hand side here. The Necrons absolutely zooming about on top speed for some reason. They are just flying around like crazy over on the left there. And the Knight Scythes moving into a position to be able to bomb the Storm Eagle, which has attempted to land in this turn. Now, I did realize sort of post this that the Storm Eagle wouldn't actually be able to land in that turn. It would have been landing next turn. However, he did survive long enough to actually be able to do it next turn anyway. So anyway, I'm rambling here. The uh, Knight Shrouds trying to bomb that Howling Griffin guy on the floor there don't quite get off the shots to be able to do so that turn anyway. So it is all fairly legit here. The Thunderhawk gunship, though, taking out uh, lots of structure points on the Night Shrouds there, though, uh, and doing quite a bit of damage on both of them as it goes in for the kill there. Six weapons on the Thunderhawk gunship, four heavy bolted turrets, some LAS cannons, and, of course, the massive cannon on the top of the gunship make it an absolute bastard to deal with for these Necrons. Much more firepower from the Astartes compared to the um, Navy, the Imperial Navy. They just don't have quite as much cutting edge. The Astartes a bit tougher and a bit more shooty, but quite plodding and slow so far. The two Xiphon Interceptors here, providing some extra gun support from sort of mid-range. These guys seem to operate best at mid-range, not short range with their weapons. They've got the uh, quad LAS cannons and, of course, the rotary frag launchers there as well. Definitely better at mid-range, these guys. So once you know the strengths and weaknesses of these planes, you can start really exploiting them. The Xiphon Interceptors, though, providing a little bit of cover here as the Necrons just zoom about doing their thing. No troops landed by the Necrons yet, though, as they get into some weird positions i think again my nine-year-old son getting a bit carried away on the speed and altitude on these guys and not really thinking too much about landing those troops yet the necrons flying about all over the place at top speed of course my son's kind of like scratching back to try and slow them down and drop their altitude so they can actually drop some troops off because i think he's realized now that he can't quite manage to take out this massive thunderhawk gunship too early in the game so he's going for the points now i think as well as taking some some damage off too but uh, it's looking a little bit difficult for the necrons as they appear to just be rolling a whole lot of misses when it comes to shooting Howling Griffins here trying to take out both of the Night Shroud bombers with only a tiny little bit of structure left. Of course, this Howling Griffin guy does actually take out both of the Night Shrouds with one foul swoop. Pretty awesome. Three weapons here, all of them kicking in and rolling pretty high here to be able to take out these Night Shrouds. Awesome shooting from the Howling Griffins there. At the end of this game, the Thunderhawk gets into the right position to be able to unload all eight of its troops. So a massive, massive game here for the Astartes in this game three. Troop insertion, a decisive win for the Astartes, 40 points to 10. 
as we go into game four. Can the Imperial forces get a draw in this campaign against the Xenos Scum, currently winning 2-1? All right, as we go into the last game of this campaign, we decided to have a massive air war. No actual scenario to go off here, but 300 points each, which is just massive. When we look at the forces assembled here, we have got quite a lot to look at. Three Xiphon interceptors with nothing new on them from the Imperials here. We have got two of the Storm Eagles here, the Minotaurs and the Howling Griffins one from the previous game. The Thunderhawk gunship makes an appearance as well as the Ares gunship from the Custodes here. An absolute monster of a um, fighter in this game as well. Let's see how he does because he was absolutely garbage in the first game of this campaign. From the Navy side, we have two lightning uh, strikes and one Thunderhaw uh, sorry, one Thunderbolt and one Thunderbolt Fury here as well. And that is 300 or round about 300 points worth of Imperial forces. Over on the uh, Xenos side though, we have an unlikely alliance. Of course, I'm making some allowances here in the fluff for my nine-year-old son. Uh, some uh, interesting alliance here between Tau and Necrons. Two Doom Scythes, two Night Shrouds, and then an entire Tau fleet as well with two Romora drones, three Barracudas, all with different weapons, and two Tiger Sharks here as well. So an absolute feast here. What we've decided to do to make this game last less than, say, 12 hours, because I know that this is probably going to take a long time, is actually just agree to have all of our fighters and bombers on the same altitude for the entirety of the game. So we're not actually altering altitude. We want to make this a bit of a quicker game. My son is incredibly confident that his Necron and Tower firepower can take out my entire force quite early in the game. We'll see how it goes, though, as we roll priority in this one. Can the Imperials claw back to a draw in this campaign, or is it going to be a resounding win for this unlikely Xenos alliance? So in turn one, some blunders made by my son here with his Necrons, moving them into a close position as my entire Imperial fleet pretty much just zooms forward very, very slowly. I decided to go very slow with everybody, trying to capitalize on my long range to mid range threat, for, certainly from the Astartes anyway, and the Thunderhawk gunship. So moving in very slowly into the center of the board, my son getting a bit overconfident here, his Tau too far back to do any damage and get any shots off. The Necrons on the left hand side here really suffering from the two Lightnings and the two Thunderbolts just moving into firing position on them. Everything sort of knickers in a twist here from the Necrons as they are realizing that they moved into a very vulnerable position position here in turn one. An absolute feast. I'm pretty happy with the fact that I've got a painted, fully painted table here, an absolute armada on both sides. Um, I rushed to paint these guys to get them finished in this campaign and they look great on the table I have to say, especially with this lava flow board here too. The uh, Night Shroud bombers have decided to get right in my face, in amongst it with some tailing fire in early turn, but my Ares gunship is there also into a particularly interesting position to get tailing fire on one of the Night Shrouds here as well with its incredibly powerful weaponry. All of the Necrons are zooming in amongst my Imperial fleet as they all surge forward into the middle of the table. The Tau aiming to face off with them on the other side of the board here as we have a lot of dice to roll off here in terms of shooting. It is pretty much just a all-out firefight here to see what happens. And so far, the Imperials looking like they might be in the slightly better position, taking some really important structure points off these Necrons early in the game. So after, I believe, turn two, there is a lot of casualties already in this game. In terms of the Imperial stuff, we've got both of the Lightnings taken out. We've got one of the Xiphon Interceptors, the Exorcist's chapter, and we've got the Minotaur's gunship there taken out. So four casualties on the Imperial side. Next to... And this is pretty interesting. Both of the Remora drones taken out one of the Doom Sides, which is absolutely excellent because the Imperials were really aiming to take out the Doom Sides early. A Night Shroud and a Barracuda. So 5-4 in the second turn. We'll see what happens in this next turn now.
Necron's kind of on the back foot, uh, suffering a little bit of structure points to the remaining two, the Night Scythe and the Doom Scythe there as well. The uh, Tau in a pretty decent position, but having lost both of the Remora drones and the Barracuda early on too, I would say that the Xenos are definitely on the back foot here as we go into the rest of this absolutely chaotic firefight here between the Imperials and the Xenos. Last turn of the game here, really, and an absolutely massive chaotic firefight between the Imperial Alliance and the Xenos Alliance here. And I have to say that turn one was really, really decisive, being able to move into those sort of slow mid-table straight up position for the uh, Imperials really did make a difference and they managed to get the early shots off of the game capitalizing on some Necron damage that really was downhill for the Xenos after that. A resounding win for the last uh, game of the campaign and yeah pretty pretty nasty. Game 4 Air War was um, you know 11-4 to the Imperials in terms of um, amounts of fighters taken off so the Imperials did 11, took 11 of the uh, opposing Xenos fleet out and lost four in return. So definitely a very convincing win for the Imperials there. So some really interesting stuff going on there. Let's go over and have a look at the post-campaign report. So here's the post-match report or post-campaign report, should I say, for the four games that we played in this Aeronautica campaign. Um, two wins for the Imperial Alliance and two wins for the Xenos Filthy Scum. And uh, I like to leave it as a draw just to annoy my son even more with a 2-2 draw. I could have done five games. We were originally going to do five games, but I just couldn't find another scenario that I liked enough to make it into that uh, into this little campaign so maybe we'll do a, a decider at some point in the future but pretty happy with the way things went of course um, a lot to learn along the way we're certainly not pros with Aeronautica so each game we kind of got better at our tactical stuff and um, two wins for the Xenos early on they absolutely smashed me the thing that I've learned most from this campaign is how horrific Necrons really are but as you saw later on in the in the games, I kind of learnt, you know, the strengths and weaknesses, certainly of the Astartes. I think the Astartes are pretty good with their high structure points and high damage dealing mid-range sort of weaponry. Um, but really, really fun there, I have to say, and uh, really nice to get those painted planes on the table and play some games of Aeronautica. If you haven't played Aeronautica, I strongly urge you to. It's a fantastic game, and I'll be playing it for many years to come, I'm sure, with my current fleets anyway. I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll be back with another video on Aeronautica in the future, I'm absolutely sure. In the meantime, though, peace out. Yeah.